majestic you are, Lord. Majestic you are Your glory This better than life Lord to me Your anointing This better
is better than life. Your anointing is better than life.
magnified, oh Lord. Be magnified, oh Lord, in my life. Be magnified, oh Lord, in my life. Be glorified, oh God, in my life. Be glorified, oh Lord, in my life. Be magnified, I pray, Lord. Be magnified, oh God. In me, be magnified in our lives, oh God. Hallelujah. Everybody say thank you, Lord Jesus. Just tell the Lord right now that you turn your whole life over to him. Just tell him, Lord, take full control of me. Oh, be magnified in my life, oh God. This is what I'm living for. Be glorified in me. Be glorified in my life, I pray, Lord. Hallelujah. Be glorified, be glorified in me. Be magnified in me. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, be magnified in my life. Lord Jesus, be magnified in my life. Be highly, highly exalted. Very simple words, Lord Jesus. Be magnified in my life. I want you to say from your heart, it's not really much of a song if it's not a prayer. It's not much of a song if it's not a request, a desperate request from your heart. And that there's anything that needs to be happening in the earth today is God's people gathered together worshiping Him in spirit and truth. Not just singing songs. Not just doing religious things. So we just want, we want to participate with what we know Father wants. You know, when you know what Father God wants to do, then if you'll do it with them, you'll be greatly successful in the kingdom of God. And, and, and that's only measured, really, when you stand before him on that day. People measure it in different ways. But it's really, on, we're living for a day. We're living for a day. And this is the day of the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day when we appear before him. Lord Jesus, be magnified in my life. Lord Jesus, be magnified in my life. Be magnified in me. Thank you, Father, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that every person in this place will come to understand what, it, what it's like to live this abundant life so filled up with you that there's room for nothing else. In fact, you don't want anything else. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. In the mighty name of the Most High God, we pray that every person will come taste and see how good it is to walk with you, to live for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. magnified in me, be magnified in me, be magnified in my life, be magnified in me, be magnified in me, be magnified in my life, be glorified, be glorified in me, be glorified in me, be glorified in my life, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, you can be seated. We welcome all of you here. We're glad you're here. We want you to understand something. Christ Jesus died for you. And even the... Well, listen. Reality of it is, is Christ Jesus left all the riches of heaven and 
became poor all for you, all for our sakes. He's an amazing, it is an amazing story of love. It defies the imagination. Nobody can keep up with it. It is so radical and so beyond all that we could think or ask. People basically make a religion out of it instead of stepping into the relationship of it. And so we're here to talk to you about how God, as it were, almost like emptied out heaven on your part, on my part. For our sake, he almost like emptied out heaven and gave us Jesus. The Word that created everything. Everything was created by Him. The one who created everything was willing to be, as it were, a creation. So that He could, in every way, touch the feelings of our infirmities, experience everything that we're going through, and prove to Satan the powers of darkness and sin and sickness and death that they had no hold or right upon that which God had shaped and formed in his own image and his own likeness. Then, he, then after having proven, after having condemned sin in the flesh, after having proven that it doesn't belong, he went and died for us on Calvary's cross. Then once again, people just want to make a religion out of it. Want to have a good Friday and an Easter Sunday. But it goes so far beyond all of these things. And today, God wants you to understand the life. He paid in full the price so that you could have a life that, that goes beyond all possible imagination, beyond all that you could ever think or ask. And yet people are living, as it were, in a realm of something that doesn't even come up to what they could think or ask. There's a lot of people just say, my goodness, there's a whole lot more I want. But yet God paid the full price for us to have a life that so few people have stepped into. And we don't want you to be sad today. We don't want you to be condemned today. We don't want you to be overwhelmed by yourself today. We want you to step out of where you've been living into a realm that God has invited you to come into. Jesus Christ stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. And he says, all you got to do is open up the door. It, 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 that really doesn't take a lot of effort on that part. I mean, my goodness. People has got to scream and holler and think that somehow through their, you know, intensity, they're going to get God to respond to them. No. He's the one being intense. He's trying to get you to respond to him. He's brought us, to, uh, brought us into a life that we call the life of God. It's a life of holiness and righteousness, which has been misdefined. It's a life of, it's a life of purity and divine glory, which has, once again has been misdefined. See, holiness and righteousness and purity and glory, this is life. People are living over in the trash can. I'm sorry to say that. I'm, I hate to minimize that, which you thought was good. But I mean, bottom line of it is, many people just live it in the garbage can of life. Because, and they're being, they being constantly overwhelmed and overrun by that which hates them. God so loves us. You know, He so loves us that when, when we were yet dead in our trespasses and sin, He committed His love towards us. If God so loved us, if He said such great passion and love for us, that he spared not his only son, but offered him up for the sins of us all. How much now shall he also freely give us all things by him? Amen. You know, I'm going to just tell you, I'm going to help you understand something. Listen, through God's love for us, we learn about love. Listen to me. I want you to understand something. Because I watch people all the time. They messing this whole thing up. They messing this whole thing up. Through God's commitment to us and faithfulness to us, we learn commitment and faithfulness to Him. Why? Because He loves us even when we ugly. He, he loves us even when we did in our trespasses and sin. He loves us even when we tripping up and fell in over and over again. He loves us. And through that love, we should learn love to Him. Now listen, you must understand me. You must understand me. That does not in any way reduce... God's call to you and I to be perfect even as our Father in Heaven is perfect. That does not reduce the reality that He says, without holiness you cannot see God to be holy even as He is holy. doesn't reduce it. doesn't reduce the reality that a God has called us to holiness and righteousness and purity. doesn't reduce the call that, that God has given to us that, that we are to be even as He is in this world. 
It doesn't reduce the call that if we have such confidence and expectation that we are to purify ourselves even as he is pure. Does it reduce that call? Every, that, that as he is, so are we now in this world. Does it reduce that call? It just causes everybody to see the reality of how God has committed to you and me to bring us all the way so long as we've not reduced what he's called us to be. What happens is I see on one extreme people to say, it doesn't matter, God loves us, he's given us all this grace, don't worry about it, go ahead and live your life the way you want to. And I'm telling you that's wrong. And then way over here on the other side of extreme, people are all caught up in their own self-performance of how they're going to get themselves right, how they're going to walk in holiness, how they're going to walk in purity. They get themselves up in all the judgment of God where the judgment of God demands absolute obedience, absolute holiness, and absolute righteousness. And in reality, Father brings the two together because He in His mercy and grace has brought the Holy Spirit into our lives to teach us how to do this. You cannot not have any less of a standard for your life than the one that God has called us to and he's called us to holiness and he said be holy even as he is holy. You cannot have any less standard that God has for our, our life which is perfect obedience, absolute surrender and consecration to him. Because I'm going to tell you right now absolute surrender and consecration to God is being willing to be committed to believing those things which he said and doing it. <laughs> the beautiful thing is is we get to learn Love through the one who loves us. Holy Ghost has come to teach us every day about Father's love. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And how do we get to see it? When we ought to be kicked out, when we ought to be dropped, kicked out of the kingdom of God, Father yet in his loving kindness and tender mercy forgives us once again. Because what's going on in our heart? What's going on in our heart is that we want to please him. And I want you to open your Bibles here with me to uh, Philippians chapter 3, 14. You know, I like to just dive in because, the rea and I hope that everybody can find their seat quickly, but I like to just dive in because I've got so much to say it would take me 24 hours to say it. Okay, so I really don't have much time to mess around with preliminaries, and, um, and so we try to give out um, bulletins and whatnot, but listen, today is a day for you to have a new beginning in God. Today is a day for you to break free from all the influences of the past. Today, tonight, I'm going to minister on the reality of how people have never really understood how to take a hold of faith and stand in it. Because what happens is they begin to experience something good from God and then all of a sudden there's opposing situations, be it sin, be it sickness, be it disease, and they capitulate and they constantly cave into it instead of learning how to stand. Having done all to stand, stand, how to, how to take a position before the living God and remain right in the place that he has called us to live, knowing that he's faithful God, that he, that he, that he will all, absolutely be committed to everything that he has promised. So I want you to open your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 14 and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to minister to you a verse of scripture that I think is absolutely keystone for you to understand what's really, what's really the Christian life what really and when we say Christian life sometimes I'm a little reluctant because I think that that's been a, applied in such a way that it's become a misnomer I'm talking about when we, when we begin to refer to the relationship with the living God and let me just tell you that that should be equated to Christian life, a relationship with a living God, where you, everything that he has, maybe you don't have the full expression of it, but you're experiencing it. Huh? You're, you're laying hold on it. You've tasted, you've seen how good he is, and you're just hungry for deeper depths of that. So are you open, have you opened your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 14? Yes. Yes. Now, I want you to listen to my translation of this verse of Scripture. And then I'm going to tell you why I translate this verse of scripture the way that I do. So listen carefully. I passionately pursue the purpose that controls every movement of my life. I'm going to say it again. I passionately pursue the purpose that controls every movement of my life. The crowning award of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was a person of few words. And... And I can say that because I can look at folks who've actually done a whole lot less than Paul and they've writ, vo written voluminous books. When you think about the totality of that which Paul has written, it's actually contained in a very small book. 
His, he was a man of exact words. He was a man, when he used words, he was a wordsmith. And he crafted his words with great power and authority. And I'm afraid that sometimes many of these verses of Scripture, it, you just don't really hear it. It doesn't really come out when we say, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling. What Paul is using, he's using three words here that speak of the arena. It speaks of that person who's running a race. And this isn't a long distance race. This is a short sprint. This is a race that, that the person, it could be a marathon, but really the intensity of the word, wording is it's a short sprint. It's like the 800 meter. It's like the 400 meter. And what's going on is he uses, he uses words that talk about, I am now started on this race. And all I've got in my mind is the finish line and that I'm crossing first. When a person, maybe you've never run before, most people have. But when you come out of those blocks, if you have been being trained for this, uh, obviously there's a whole lot of background that goes into training. But you come out of those blocks, you're not thinking about what you're going to have for lunch. You're not thinking about what happened yesterday. You're not thinking about what you might do next year. You're not thinking about possibly changing your major in college. You're not... You thinking about one thing and one thing only. You're thinking about crossing a finish line that you might ultimately come into a place where that you receive an award that surpasses everything that you've ever, well really a, a, an award that has been the whole uh, consuming focus of your entire life. Imagine if today you would say, and I just used the King James, that now my life, your life, is all about pressing towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God that is in Christ Jesus. And then you begin to understand it in, the, in, 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 in terms of how Paul ministered these things. And I, I want you to back up in Philippians and I want to try to flesh that out for you just a little bit. In verse 7, he says, But what things were gained to me, those counted, I, I've counted loss for Christ. Everything that I valued my life to be, all the purpose that I had in my life, the way I defined my life, the meaning of my life, my career, those things that I, had, I hoped to achieve, all of those things, all of a sudden, when I stepped into this realm of this unspeakable gift, I counted it as nothing. I counted it as vanity. I counted it as something that I don't even want attached to me or affixed to me anymore. It's lost to me. It's, it's, in, in fact, he's, he says uh, elsewhere, he said, the world, uh, actually in Philippians, he says, the world is crucified to me and I'm crucified to it. All those things that I value valued are meaningless in other words. He says, yes, and doubtless, verse 8, I count all things meaningless except for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. Can you imagine? Can, listen, come here, listen to me. Can you imagine stepping into a realm where everything else is meaningless to you but Jesus? And I think that there are people here that have done that. Now, what's, what, we, what we've got to understand is how then does the dynamics of that relationship begin to work out in our life where we're really finding ourselves constantly trusting in the one who's come to teach us, to guide us, to lead us, to perfect everything that concerns us. Instead of as many people in life, I've watched them, they trip up. They fall down and they become overwhelmed with condemnation. They become overwhelmed with a, a sense of failure, overwhelmed with inability. I'm going to tell you, all that does is declare to you how much you've been living your life for yourself, not for Jesus, for yourself. So all you need to do is just repent for the bigger issue. Okay? That you trust in yourself and that you define yourself and your identity and who you are based upon what you personally can achieve, what you personally can do. The best thing to do is at that moment, cry out to God and say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm committed to you. Lord, I thank you that you changed me and I thank you that you perfect everything that concerns me. Looking, at, looking to the author and finisher of your faith. Hallelujah. My goodness, if you're going to run a race, if you're going to win, you're going to have to look to the author and finisher of your faith. Dear people, I, I watch folks get distracted in so many different areas of life. And really what's going on all the time is they're allowing different definitions and different meanings of their life to slip in. When in reality, we need to keep something before us that actually controls every movement of our life. It influences every stride that we make, everything that we do. Our whole will is bent towards that. 
You know, I love hearing that wonderful Holy Ghost meeting that took place in 1904. I think of it often with Evan Roberts. He's in a little church and you know, today we think if it's God, it's got to be big. But really, God's never done anything. He's never really done much big. He's always done it with few. And when it was big, he said, no, 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 it's got to be less. You know, Gideon's army, he had a whole bunch of people come. He said, it's too many. They're going to say that they did it by their own strength, by their own cunning. Send everybody home that's afraid or just married somebody or got other issues or got other focus or got other concerns. Just send them home. And a lot of people left. I mean, about two-thirds of them left right there. Everybody had other concerns. And, wow, we're getting released. Okay, I don't have to lose face on this. You know, yeah, because I did. Actually, I did just marry wife. And, yeah, actually, I did just plant the field. And, yeah, you know what? I really got all this work to do that I know is a bigger value and purpose than me just dying out here with the rest of these, you know, guys. And, um... Then it still was too many. And, and so the Lord pared it down a little bit more. He said, no, 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 no. He said, he said, have everybody separate themselves based upon how they drink water, how they, you know, that's, that's a pretty interesting kind of uh, criticism. How, we're going we're gonna to separate you based on how you drink water. But at any rate, there was just a few men left after that. And I was, oh yeah, that's good, that's good, that's, that, that'll work. And dear people, it, it's so important for us to recognize, we, we, we quantitate things personally on ourselves and on the, and our, and the circumstances around us and environments around us. And then through that, we then interpret whether or not God can do anything with us. Stop. Don't do that no more. Okay? God chose the foolish things. You, you, I qualify. Okay? God chose the weak things, things to despise. I qualify. And so if you want to qualify, you can qualify as well. And then God can live mightily through your life. But at any rate, back to the story. I love to think of it often because it was just a small little church. It was, it was about this many people and about this big right over here. Okay? Didn't have the rest of the church. Huh? Maybe some people walked in here this morning and said, church too small. The church not too small. Your vision too small. Your imagination too small. Your faith too small. Huh? Nothing's impossible for them to believe. Are you with me? Okay. Just a little small church. And a preacher comes and he ministers a message. And a young man who's 13 years old hears it. And he, and he falls upon his knees and he says, Oh God, bend my will. Bend me. Bend, me, bend my will. He, he'd be willing, he's willing to take up a message that uh, the Apostle Paul said, Be conformed to the image of Christ. The reality of it is, people, God has worked this amazing miracle for us that even allows us to do this. There's no way you and I could be conformed to the image of Christ if it had not been for the new birth. There'd been no way you and I could be conformed to the image of Christ if it had not been for the teaching, guiding, leading of the Holy Ghost. He's, what do you think he's come here to do? He's come here to correct us and teach us and show us and lead us and guide us. He's come to model. People, I'm going to tell you, teaching, big part of teaching is model. What is he modeling? He's modeling how much forgiveness God has, how much love God has, how much mercy God has. Hey, he's modeling for us how much faithfulness God has, how much commitment God has. And who does he, how does he model it? He models it to us in the most personal and relevant way. When God's forgiven us, when God's showing mercy for us, when God's showing faithfulness towards us. And through that relationship... We then learn that love. We learn to walk in that faithfulness. We learn to walk in that commitment. Listen to me, people. I want you to try to grab a hold of this. I know it's hard for you. God loves you. He loves you to the day of you. To, he loves you all the days of your life. The day you read that's your last breath, you're going to come into judgment. If you've not been willing to learn, then ultimately your judgment is sound. Your judgment is sealed. Your judgment is right. Your judgment is true. It's God's judgment. He gave you a lifetime. To learn this. You know, the scripture says that God has great compassion upon us as a father has great compassion upon his children. But what happens is I see the deceptions go on. You know, I'm going to spend a little bit more time with Philippians here. But Paul opens up with some radical, some radical insights in the first part of Philippians. He says, beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the mutilators. He didn't say circumcision. Or the circumciser. He said mutilators. Okay? Because what he was dealing with was he was dealing with Christian missionaries that were coming along saying uh, that now you got to do this or you don't, don't have to do that. And bringing other things along with the message of salvation rather than making Jesus the central focus of having fulfilled everything that we need to be pleasing unto God. With, somehow they would try to bring ad, additions or subtractions in to the whole relationship. You cannot remove away the high calling of God to, to rule and reign with Him forever in a glorified body. Think about this people. I want you to just listen to me now. In 1 John 
John chapter 3, the scripture says that we shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him. What a high, this is the high calling. This is the resurrection of the dead. This is the glorified body that now has taken on the same, the same immortal, eternal glorified qualities of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. People, you can't play games with God and win because I'm going to tell you right now, Satan knows the posers. He knows the game players. He knows those people who are not willing to get real with God. When you get real with God, you know what you're going to do? You learn how to trust him. You're going to learn how to, when, you, when I say you learn how to trust him, you learn how to look to Jesus as the author of your faith and the finisher of your faith. You learn how to look to God to perfect you. You've got just as much hunger and passion to please him as anything else. I mean, there's nothing more important for you to, to you than to please him. But you look to God, the Holy Spirit, to give you that ability. And it doesn't matter how many times you trip up, you get up. Amen. Let's say it again. It doesn't matter how many times you trip up, you get up. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you trip up and you don't get up, all God's trying to do is show you that your faith is in yourself and not in Him. He wants you to turn and look to this wonderful provision. People, hell's worth missing. Quit being so sad and despondent towards Him. Look at what He did for you. Yes. Hallelujah. Men, come on now. Look at what he did for you now. I would say that everybody should get happy. I would say that everybody should be blessed. I would say that, I would say that everybody should just say, Sorrow, you don't belong around here anymore because I've got somebody who's protecting me and keeping me, modeling everything that I'm supposed to learn. And he's so committed to me. He so desperately loves me that no matter how many times I sin, he'll forgive me so long as I'll learn to forgive everybody else with me, along with that. Are you listening to me, dear people? Are you listening? Listen, you must understand. You can't, you can't have it one without the other. You can't have it over here that God's just going to forgive you and he's going to count all your sin as nothing. And you don't really, after all, we're all just human beings. And after all, we got to, you know, sin more or less every day and live this kind of a life. Because then there is no passion. You can't say that your whole life is about going after a prize. That your whole life is about passionately pursuing. And that is exactly uh, the, the way that the chaos ought to be uh, translated to passionately pursue something. To, because it's, when we, when we think, if there's nothing else to consider, but how much God loves us, and the great need that we all have for love. Is there anybody in here that does, doesn't need to be loved? Would you raise your hand? Okay, thank you. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you right now, you might not know it, but love is very, 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 very valuable to you, and you actually pursue love you pursue love desperately and earnestly and you might try to say that you don't and I tell you your mind will play games on you but I'm telling you and then you're going to go pursue love from some human being and then you're going to try to get something out of it. You're going to be a vampire as it were, spiritually. Try to get something, a leech. I probably better say leech, isn't it? Okay, huh? Blood sucker. Okay, something. Somebody try and pull the life out of somebody else because they can't give you what you want. They can't give you what they need. There are marriages messed up, bad messed up simply because people are trying to get something from another human being that, can, that that other human being can't even give them. There is a love that you can receive from your wife and a love you can receive from your husband, love you can receive from your parents, a love you can receive from your children. But I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't satisfy the love that you need that comes only from the Father. It is a divine love that is, was absent from man the moment that they sinned. A divine love that Satan in every work that he does constantly works to separate you from it, to keep you void of it so you can't have it. The first thing that happens when the glory of the Holy Ghost comes into life, he brings love God. And see, the love of God poured in our heart by the Holy Ghost. He pours it in. Hallelujah. Uh, and as long as you're drinking of that love, well, my, my, my. And it's a love. Hey, listen, is this. If he spared not his own son, but freely offered him up for us all, how shall he not also buy him freely give us all things? Don't you think he's going to perfect you? Don't you, think it, don't you think that as the author, he can also be the finisher? Do you think that you can begin this good work now by the Spirit, by the miracle of salvation, and then finish it up on your own? Give me a break. How, what does it mean to come and abide in Christ Jesus? What does it mean to come and live in Him? Yeah, it means to come and, and, and learn to walk in holiness and purity and righteousness. It also, also, it also means to be constantly, totally, faithfully committed to knowing that He is going to perfect everything that concerns you. Isn't it good? I'm very happy. Are you very happy? 
Hallelujah. And you know, when Paul, 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 listen, Paul calls this, listen to me very carefully. Paul calls this, verse 314, the, he calls this the qualification of them that are perfect. You want to see that? You, how many want to see that? So I didn't think anybody was perfect. Look, we're perfect and being perfected. Are you listening? Huh? It's true. It's true. We're, we're learning. He is, he's made it, you could say, you could say he just made us complete. He's, we're complete in him. You know, and, and, and can I, let me help you with let me help you with a verse of scripture or blow your mind. Are you ready? Uh -huh. you, I'm probably already bit your mind and I always blow it while it's bent. First John two twenty says you received the anointing from the Holy Ghost and you know everything. <laughs> and now if you go try to tell people, I know everything, they're gonna look at you and go, What? Yeah, just go ahead and just quote the scripture and distance yourself from it. Okay? You have, and this isn't taking it out of context. Listen, come on, people. You know, you might have been able to say that about me when I was 21 years old. I'm 55 now, okay? And, and uh, praise God. <laughs> we, spent, we spent many hours uh, sorting out these things and, and, and presenting ourselves before the Lord so these things could be perfectly established in our lives. But what Paul, Paul, Paul says, and, and I just want you to look at this with me here in verse 15. You know, after having said this wonderful statement, can I read it to you again? Can I read to you again? Can I, can, I, can, I, can I get you to embrace this? Can I get you to, can I get you, can I get you to value what Jesus did for you more than anything you've ever did for you and every, anything anybody else has ever done for you? Can I get you to value what God has given you as a free gift, as the most wonderful and awesome treasure that you could possibly ever have? Can I get you this to do that? Because if I can, then you'll do this. You will passionately pursue the purpose that controls every movement of your life. You will passionately pursue, I said you passionately pursue, you will passionately pursue the purpose that controls every movement of your life. I said you will passionately pursue the purpose that controls every movement of your life. Hallelujah. I'm going to say it again. You will passionately pursue the purpose that controls every movement of your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because it's really all going, it's really going to all be about living out this abundant life in this wonderful gift that God has freely given to us. This new heart, this new spirit, this new nature that has been supplied to us so that we can be all taught of God. So that we can know everything. What does it mean to know everything? Thing. What does it mean to know everything? Does that mean you know everything about photonics? No, you don't even know what, you know what photonics is. Does that mean you know everything about the, you know, the, the history database of, uh, of the world? No. You, know, you probably don't even know hardly what happened you know, in 1920. But it's, it's about knowing everything about God. Father has given us the capacity to know everything about Him. Hey, listen. God, Father has given us a capacity to so know everything about Him that we don't even need to be, even need to be taught. That's what He's going to say in verse uh, 29 of the same chapter in 1 John. He gives us a capacity to be taught of the Holy Ghost. He's given us the capacity. The Holy Spirit has come and He's come to bring everything to us that belongs to the Lord Jesus. And Jesus said everything that the Father has is mine. He's going to come and He's going to bring it to you. No, all I got to do is just be wanting, all I got to do is just be passionately wanting this. I want this. I want this. Listen, I'm going to tell you today, listen to me. You may not even know Jesus, but if before you left the service this morning, you called upon the name of the Lord Jesus, you could go out and represent Jesus Christ on a scale that will blow people's mind. You could say to the blind, see the deaf, hear the cripple walk. You could, I mean, you, you could, you could command the wind and the wave because you, you could, you could be a representation of God where all of his joy and all of his peace would actually flow through your life and smack other people with such divine glory that they wouldn't when they want to know where you got that huh? and it was all free you could have joy unspeakable and full of glory you could receive a mantle of praise for a garment of heaven uh, for, for a garment of heaviness you could receive you could receive the oil of joy instead of walking around sorrowful and sad wow my God, did he give it to us instantaneously what what didn't what on this journey what happens people get they people get their they get their desires and their affections and their, the definition of who they are and their purpose caught away in other things and they become greatly disappointed. Papa wants you to learn how to live by faith. He wants you to learn how to walk in faith. He wants you to learn how to live by the Holy Spirit. How to walk in the Holy Spirit who's going to model these things for us. I know about forgiveness because God the Holy Spirit came and taught me about forgiveness. First of all, He put forgiveness on the inside of me, a nature to forgive. And then He showed me how to do it and it's all of its complex ways and I'm still learning. And I'm growing. And I'm, I'm maturing. Why, why, why give up on that? 
Why give up on that? Why give up on someone who's never going to give up on you? Why disqualify yourself when God's qualified you? When he says, listen, I've got a means and a provision to cleanse and wash away all of your sins. I've got a means and a provision to forgive you 490 times in a day if necessary. You know, that's like every two minutes or something. <laughs> Are you with me? I mean, how many people use forgiveness that much this morning so far? <laughs> it's about trusting God instead of trusting ourselves, turning to Him instead of turning inward. It's about, oh God, help me, Father. I seem to be, I seem to be the slowest learner in the class, but I thank you that you freely give me all things by Jesus because I've asked. Instead of going, some people go for days, go for weeks, go for months without getting it right with God. What is the Lord trying to show you? He's trying to show you that you're living your own life for yourself and that you're your own perfecter. And you've got to stop, you've got to stop that because that's one miserable way to live. Huh? How about when you throw yourself upon the mercies of God and they big mercies? How about, I, I, think one of the, I think one of the most common words in the Old Testament and New Testament is faithfulness and it's derivative faith. Yeah. And faithful. Papa's faithful. He uh, stand by you. Nothing can separate you from him. Not devils, not angels, not things to come, not things present. Nothing. That's called commitment, man. Ain't nobody, there's no one ever been committed to you as God is committed to you. And yet we watch time and time again as people live their life sorrowful and sad and despondent to one, instead of just rejoicing in God for His great salvation. And, and all it is, it's because you're under a cloud of deception, a ploy of Satan that's keeping you from the lover of your soul. Kiss him with the kisses of your mouth and stop that. <laughs> Listen to me. Give you, just turn your whole heart towards Him and begin to trust Him. To start moving. I mean, Paul said, look, you know, I could tell you, I could boast in Philippians earlier in the chapter, he said, I could boast of all these different things. But I've left them all behind. You know, it's like Abraham. Abraham gets his call from God and he leaves everything behind. He, he allows God to redefine his life, to redefine the meaning of his life, to redefine his existence. You talk about trusting God every step of the way. <laughs> You talk about learning a whole new existence, a whole new way. But God found one man that was so faithful. I don't think it was necessarily the first man that Father tried to get to be faithful. I was blessed by hearing Reinhardt say one time, Oh God, why did you use me to shake Africa? He said, you weren't my first choice. That should help you feel a little better. Oh, I wasn't. Revelation. We all think that we would be the first choice. But that's the thing that we got to deal with about ourselves. Because we all think we're so, you know, whatever. And we're not going to go into that. And we need to get over that. We need to deny that, push that aside. Because Jesus is the one. I mean, he's given us the privilege of living the life that he has. Having the relationship and the quality of relationship that he has with the Father. Which is superior to the... Listen, you could never qualify to be an angel. Let me say that. Are you with me? Hello. Over there. You could never ever qualify to be an angel. Much less could you ever qualify to be a seraphim who's never sinned. You'd never even qualify. You couldn't qualify to be a cherubim by any means, one who protects the anointing. You could never qualify. And yet God has exalted our lives and, and the meaning and the value of our lives above angels, above seraphim, above cherubim. He's valued our life and qualified and defined our life in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, come over here and abide in me. It means trust in me. Let me teach you how to live a life that you know nothing about. Are you listening to me? Yes. And you know, when Jesus said, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect, in, in Matthew chapter 6, he's literally defining to us an instruction and lie, that a quality of life that we've got to learn. And he's saying, now be committed to it and, 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 and watch what's going to happen. Achieve the goal. Get the reward. Get the prize. You and I got this high calling. The word that Paul uses there in this high calling it, it harkens back to a phrase because he used all, he used qualifying words, four words there that makes primarily the value and the meaning of the sentence come alive 
with respect to the arena. And the one with the high calling is where the emperor, after that you had won the race, the emperor himself calls you into the winner's circle and himself crowns you with the wreath. Huh? Crowns you. My goodness, dear people, listen to me. Come on. And in that day, you're going to be, and I'm going to be so humbled that we're just going to fall down on our face and we're going to take the crown off our head and we're going to put it on his, at his feet and we're going to say, to you alone belongs all the glory. You alone did all this for Amen. me. Yes. Yeah. We're not going to stand there and go, yeah, you know what? I really worked hard for this. I deserve this. My. And just start waving at people as they start applauding. You know, it start waving. Yeah. Woohoo. Yeah. Like you, when you got your diploma at college, you see how you got your diploma and they're like, ah, you don't know how hard I work to get this. It's going to happen. It's not going to happen that way. We learn to trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He, he will save you and he saved you. He's my savior over and over again. You know what savior means? It means deliver. It's one who comes gets you out your problem. As one who delivers you from the snare. He's not just my Savior. I can prove He's my Savior. He saves me every time. In every situation. Everything that opposes me. Everything I get myself into. He comes rescues me. He's my, he's my, he's my Redeemer. He's taken, erased everything that is offense to God. He's removed it from off my line. So that I might have a perfect uninhibited relationship with the Father. Thank you. Hey, there's no reason for you to be in condemnation. Huh? There's no reason for people to walk around all sorrowful looking. Goodness gracious. You're not a Roman Catholic. I mean, you're not getting beat up with condemnation every day. Say you've got to do more. I mean, you know. So he's always picking on his denomination. They're doing the best they can. Forgive me. <laughs> it just came to me. I'm so sorry. But it is. There, and, even, and I could say even in the Pentecostal movement. I could say even in the Baptist movement. I could say in every movement. The Lutheran movement. That there is just always this, this seemingly ongoing condemnation where people can't make it to the church on Sunday because they feel bad about what they did on Saturday night. Well, number one, you should feel bad about what you did on Saturday night. But number two, you should come and and to the refuge, you should come lay hold on God and say, Oh God, forgive me. I'm sorry. Oh God, I want to learn how to walk this way. I want my whole life to be defined by my passion and pursuit to define my every movement. Yeah. I lay in hold of you this high calling that is in Jesus Christ. Are you listening to me? Yeah. I pray in Jesus' name you are. Because if I was really saying this the way I feel it, I'd be screaming at the top of my lungs on a level that would be hurting your ears. <laughs> Because it's, I'm so passionate about it. It's about time God's people get, tr get comfortable trusting the Lord. That can look at, you can look at your life and say, my life that was I once lived, it's over. And now I'm living a whole new life. And God's showing me how to live it. And He's defining it for me. And I'm going to quit learning how to speak bad about other people. I'm going to quit learning how to fall into sexual immorality. I'm going to quit learning how to do all these other evil things that have been a part of my life. Because Father doesn't want any of it in my life. You know, you, it's not hard to walk by a person and see if a person's got a problem with you. How many of you seen that? Yeah. You know that? You walk by a person and they're like already ducking. They're going for the shadow as soon as you come by. You know they got a problem. You don't have to have discerning of spirits. It's not your problem. It's their problem. They're the ones running. It goes on all the time between God and his people. They ducking out of the presence of the Lord. They running and hiding. They trying to cover their sin. The Lord says you're never going to prosper covering your sin. You're never going to run. You're never going to hide running to yourself. Running, ducking and hiding. And then all of a sudden you become so overwhelmed with the problem that now you're about to die. So you come, into the, you come and get some help. And now you're going good for a week or two or three weeks and then you fall on your face again and you're now back off the wagon for another four or five months. And you're living your life that way. And my goodness, why don't you stop doing that? Those of you listen to, my, listen to me by web, because I'm sure no one in here is that way. So he's going, I, mean, I must be talking to somebody living by the, on, watching on the web. Or perhaps it's YouTube. People, God has a purpose for you. And Satan fights this purpose. That purpose is that Jesus Christ be manifested and revealed to your life. When I listen to Paul talking to the Philippian church... And I understand his passion. Because I can back up here for just a second. Just back up with me here to a verse of scripture just before this. In verse 10. Here's Paul. 
Paul, listen. Paul has something that none of us have had. I want. Desperately, but I've not had it. Paul had Jesus Christ show up to him and say, Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? He says, Lord, what do you mean? What am I doing? He says, it's hard for you to kick against me, isn't it? Who are you? I'm Jesus Christ, whom you persecute. Can I, can I say this before I go anywhere? Anytime you persecute any of God's people, you persecute Jesus. Because Paul never persecuted Jesus. He persecuted those who represent Jesus. Yeah. That's, how, that's, how, that's how in this he is with us. Yeah. Come on, man. That's how committed he is. That's how much he'll stand with us, man. He is faithful. I'm telling you right now, everybody else will walk away from you, but he will yeah, not yes. walk away from you. you. He defines a whole new meaning to loyal. He's got a whole new meaning of loyal. And nobody ever been this loyal. The, you, know, you know, a dog is so loyal, they'll die for you. They'll die for you. If you've got a dog that you've... Are you with me? I hope I'm not offending anyone with this comparison. Okay, if I am, get over yourself. The reality of it is, <laughs> hallelujah. Uh, that will help you. This is the title The reality of it is this. That loyalty of defending you even unto death. And I've got many examples. I was just had a with a person the other day. He's telling me he was going up into the woods to get a bull out that no one else could get. The bull had been up there hurt for a long time. And now he was recovered. And even no one, no one around, no one could get a rope around him because he just barely stick his head out from underneath the juniper tree and pull his head back in. So he sent his dog in to flush the, cat, the bull out. And this meaning be meaningful to Kevin, maybe a couple, one or two other people. Flush the, the bull out. And the, and the bull comes, he's, he's the, dog, the dog got the bull out of the tree, but he come right, charged the horse, knocked him over. Knocked the horse over. Horse landed on him. And the bull's coming for him. But the dog laid into him. Because of Magnab. And Magnab lay into cow anyways. From the front. Got him. Cut him from his eye all the way down to his lip. Just hanging on to him. Not letting go. And basically the. For all practical purposes. The bull killed the dog. But the. the you know. The life of the man was saved. I'm telling you. God has done for something for us. And you can say Wow. And he was telling me, about, I'll do anything for that dog. <clears throat> I'll do anything for that dog. You know, they were able to save the dog after large expense. Because they, I'll do anything for that dog because that dog saved my life. I can preach now on that. Because yeah. <laughs> I want to elevate that. Yeah. I want to take it over into God doing that for you. Yeah. My God. People, it, you say, oh, well, it's been a practical experience for me and interaction with me when it's a dog. Well, we want it to be a practical interaction for you with the Holy Spirit. We want it to be a practical, we're trying, we're working on compelling you to come. So it'll be a practical experience for you in your walk with Jesus Christ. You have to learn to trust Him having begun in the Spirit. Having received the miracle of salvation, are you now made perfect by your own ability, by your own works, and by your own striving, and by your own doings, and by your own observations? Are you going to become God's dependent little child? Hallelujah. You're going to become God. Are you going, are you going to become that one who leans on Jesus' name and leans upon Him alone? Huh? I, I, I will not trust this. Sweetest frame, but holy lean on Jesus' name has been a song in the church for a long time, but people need to start doing it. Huh? On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. You can find out whether or not you're trusting in God because the storms of life are going to come. The winds are, and the wave will beat, 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 beat vehemently against your house. If you totally trust in Jesus and Jesus alone, you will stand. If you're trusting in yourself, boom, you're over. You're going to fall. You're going to collapse. I mean, he'll, he'll forgive you of adultery. He will. He'll forgive you of murder. Paul was a murderer of the church. He'd he forgive you of every possible thing that you can imagine. Except for one thing. Can't blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. But if you blasphemed against the Holy Ghost, you probably wouldn't be here. And if, if you were here, you wouldn't last for long because nobody blasphemed against the Holy Ghost can stand to listen to me talk. Huh? It's true. It is true. They cannot stand listen to me, me or anybody like me talk. Too much glory, too much anointing. Amen. Too much truth. They, people that blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, they can, only, they can only be satisfied with religion. They'll have plenty of it. 
Pharisees are a good model of it. Plenty of religion. Huh? Are you listening to me? Yes. And besides that, nobody in this place, I'm going to say this is kind of harsh because, you know, I'm kind of harsh kind of guy in this respect. You know? You don't want to be called a dog, evil worker, or a mutilator either. Paul must have been having a bad day. Somebody said, no, he wasn't having a bad day. He was angry against everybody who polluted the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all. Huh? And when, when they start polluting the gospel of Jesus Christ, he'd call them witches. Who's bewitched you that you should believe another gospel? Huh? That you should believe some other, you know, substitute message. Huh? Mangeshe Kodatai. Oh, my. And you don't have to worry about being any of those things. You don't have to worry. Oh, today, maybe I said something that's causing you worry. Then dive into the presence of the Lord. Grab a hold of the mercy and say, Oh, God, I trust you, Lord Jesus. I, Father, I see that you spared not your own son for me. Can you, make this, can you make this wonderful message of salvation personally applicable to your own life? Can you see Jesus going to the cross? Can you see God, rather, emptying out heaven, the Creator, becoming a creation, as it were, to save you? Can you see him going to the cross personally for you? Can you see that loyalty, that love, that passion, that goodness being, it being all done for you? I see it all done for me. That's why I feel, I think I'm so comfortable in God. I want you to see these things. Quit, quit fighting God. Quit listening to a demon spirit that hates God, that constantly disqualifies God, that constantly makes God the, the bad guy. Come on. Quit making the call to salvation something that you resist because you can only resist the Holy Ghost so long. You can only resist the Holy Ghost so long. I mean, in other words, you know, when you say you resist the Holy Ghost, you're resisting forgiveness. That's pretty hectic. Are you listening to me? Resisting mercy. Resisting grace. Resisting being taught. Being loved. Resisting every good thing and every perfect thing. Is that deception or what? That is probably, could there be anything that would exemplify deception more than that? I, 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 I don't think so. Today, would you move the resistance out of the way? Today, would you just be willing to deny yourself and say, you know what, it's not about me, it's about you, Lord. I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm his. Paul's will was integrated with Father's will. It was. Paul's will, he said, if I preach the gospel against my will, that's what he said. If I preach the gospel against my will, then an then administration of the kingdom of God has been given unto me. He had so allowed his life to be completely under the control and mastery of Jesus Christ. Today we're asking you, will you let Jesus be your master? Will you let the Holy Ghost be your master? Will you let him take every wrong thing and make it right? Turn it to the right. Will you let him teach you the ways of God? Not the ways of an angel. Not the ways of a seraphim who's never sinned in his, in his existence. Not the ways of the cherub, not the ways of the best person you can think of, but the ways, his own ways. Wow. Hallelujah. <laughs> My, I pray that maybe, maybe today you're listening to me and you don't even have a way to qualify that. You don't even have a way to define that. Well, let me just define it like this. Let me define it as your most joyful moment in life. Let me define it as the moment where you were so loved and so in love. Let me define it as that. Okay, let me define it as the time where you had so much peace and nothing could bother you. You were having such a good day. You could handle any bad news. It didn't matter because it was all things were good. Huh? Let me define it as that. That's what Father has for us. That's what he has for us. And you say, I want that. Well, good. He wants that for you. Now let him teach you. Well, how? By trusting him, thanking him, praising him, taking a stand in those things which God has promised to do. That's why Paul said in Hebrews 10, 23, he said, hold fast. In other words, hold strongly with determination. Do not let it go. Were you saying, I'm not letting go of this? Right? Hold fast. You're dangling off of a cliff. Hold fast. Hold fast. The confession of your faith. Without wavering. Because God's faithful who promised. You know, when you think about Father counting the hairs of your head, you're thinking about him, Jesus Christ. Prayer is an important thing. 
It's so important that Jesus forever lives to do it. He forever lives. His whole, he defines his existence. Jesus, come on now. Jesus has nothing better to do than to define his existence on the, on the, on the value of continually praying for us. Last night the Lord woke me up at 3.05 in the morning with the urgency that I had to go to prayer. And when you've grown in prayer, you don't, you just not guess. It's basically God's got a hold of you. He's got your wheel. He's got you. It doesn't matter who's sleeping in the house. It doesn't matter. And you're not, you're not, you're not going to be able to lay there. And under that strong compulsion of the Holy Ghost, we began to pray. Mom woke up, prayed with me. About an hour later, then the Lord just said, okay, and go on sleep. And I don't worry about it. He'll make up your sleep. You won't feel like you got up in the, in the middle of the night. You won't. And you go back to sleep quick. The Papa said there's an urgency to pray. He never revealed to me last night what I was praying about. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. But what I, what I think is when that, when that happens to me, where everything in my life has... Is, where God has grabbed a hold of me and everything about my life and the meaning of my life and the purpose of my life that is superior to sleep. Sleep is a strong force, isn't it? It's stronger than the power of sleep. It's stronger than the... which is stronger than the power of hunger. It's stronger than the power of thirst. It is. One day you'll close your eyes and go to sleep for the final time. That's how powerful it is. Right now you have just interruptions of that sleep. Huh? I, th I, I could go to bed thinking about Papa, how he prays and intercedes for me. Jesus, how he prays and intercedes for me. Holy Spirit, how he's praying and interceding for me. He's living in us. And he, he knows the will of the Father and the mind of the Father. He's making intercession with, for us with great groanings. And if you've ever been taken by the spirit of prayer, you know it's a deep, it's a deep, you could actually define it as a spiritual pain. It's a pain. It's almost physical. It's why pray and hide. <clears throat> pray and hide. The doctor said that pray and hide had actually moved his heart from one side of his chest to the other by the time he was 36 years old because he prayed for India that India be saved. One friend of mine was asking God, said, why? Why did this happen to this man, this your servant? He, God said to him, he said, because he did the work that I called a hundred men to do. And only one would do it. And I'm afraid that that's been too often the scenario. Too often the scenario. There's some of us in here, we wouldn't think for a second about letting somebody else do our work. We wouldn't think about burdening somebody to that point. Taking advantage of somebody to that point. Come on now, listen to me. Huh? We got a work, we got a job of work to do here. We got the work of heaven to do here. We got the kingdom of God here to do. Don't let Satan distract you anymore. Don't let these trip ups, don't let your immaturity. Hey God, listen to me you children, you babies. Listen to me babies. I write unto you little small children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Amen. Everybody ought to rejoice in that. Somebody said, I don't want to be a baby. Well good, grow up. Amen. But for now, just be happy your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Amen. I wouldn't want to be a baby either. I've never been like to be called a baby. So I mean, don't call him a baby. Well, if you're a baby, you're a baby. Okay? But listen, this is, this is one time to be uh, caused uh, to rejoice when you're a baby. Because your, your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. That's cause to rejoice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's somebody said, that's so good, I'll just stay here for the rest of my existence. Well, I'm, I'm afraid then that uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 14 will never be the definition of your lie. Huh? Are you listening to me? But all, oh, what would happen if you and I would let the Holy Ghost show us firsthand how to forgive because he forgives us so much. Firsthand how to walk in purity because he models it for us and shows, it, shows us how good it is and how better, how much better it is contrast and comparison to all those things that destroy you and hurt you. Oh, come now, come now, come now, come now, little children, hearken unto me and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desires to live and would like to see many blessed and good days? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips that they speak no guile. 
pursue peace with all men. Live in this realm of fellowship and in love. Somebody said, well, I've been failing. Okay, but let me tell you to focus on something better. Why don't you say, I am learning. Huh? One's positive, the other one's negative. I've been failing. Well, how about, I've been learning. <clears throat> can, we, can we practice that maybe? <clears throat> say, I've been failing. Say it, say, I've been failing. Say, so I'm not saying that no more. Say, I am learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. And to be committed and consecrated to this learning because you're so persuaded. You're so certain. Hallelujah. You know, I, I have many ministers come through here and some that they just know of you. They've never been here. With one couple were going to come. One person in particular was going to come just this past week and just sneak in. And everybody says everywhere. I mean, because... And there's, we, just, we just know a lot of folks. The God's raising up people in this place that they could go anywhere and preach the gospel. Go anywhere and bring the message of salvation on the level of this gospel of the kingdom should be preached in all the world as a witness to every nation. Then the end shall come. This is why when, this is why when I've had so many opportunities to do other things, Father was saying. And one time, a couple of times, actually the Lord gave me an option. I said, no Lord, I'll, I'll be faithful. Because I know that Father's going to do this work. That Father's doing this work and He's done this work. Um, and, he's, and, 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 and it's going to continue to grow. And, and that from this place, missionaries and, and ministers will be sent out all over the world. Amen. And not go with some religious ditty. Not go with some false representation. You know, just something other than what Jesus himself did. But we'll go about now learning. I, I want to, learning how not to speak out of your own thoughts and out of your own words. Because it's just weird. You know, once you start speaking by the Spirit of the Lord, everything you said up to that point, up before that, is weird. And from there on, you, you're, what you say is defined as weird. Huh? Because what he says is so good yes. and so right and so exact and so necessary. Huh? And so meaningful. And Papa's going to teach us that. He teaches how to speak out of the realms of the Spirit instead of out of the realms of our weirdness. <laughs> out of the realms of our head. Does anybody in here don't think that you're weird? Could you raise your hand? <laughs> you are, believe me. The only one who's not is the Spirit of the Lord, the living God who's on the inside of you. Speaking out of yourself, doing things out of yourself, weird. And because weird is just, you know, it, it's, 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 it's off track. It's left field. It's not real meaningful, you know. When you got to walk up to somebody and start talking about the weather, that's weird. There's a lot better things to talk about whether or not it rained. Why do you care? You're not a farmer. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> huh? <laughs> I'm not going to go too much into that today. I don't want to make anybody feel any, bad, any worse than they already do. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for goodness, for mercy. It follows me all the days of my life. I pray today, after today, you can laugh at yourself hysterically. You can hysterically laugh at yourself. I pray in Jesus' name that you can grow that much to really be able to identify yourself compared to the life of Jesus. To laugh at it so you can just courageously and with total abandonment, deny it from here on out. <laughs> to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. He's got a life for us to live, people. It's very, very different. 
is a very different life than any other model in human existence. It's a very different life. It's a good one. It's a wonderful one. I pray in Jesus' name you lay hold on it. I must say, I want to just give you this one last verse of scripture. You know, I, I was going to, I was backing up to verse 10. I never said this. But here's Paul. He's, Paul, Paul, listen. Paul, in what he had learned, in what he had been able to give himself, his dad evidently was a wealthy man. He was a Roman citizen. He came from a wealthy family. Okay? He was allowed to go to the best school and the best university. That's all definition of wealth. Are you with me? He said at Gamaliel's feet, the best of the best preacher, uh, uh, teachers, sages of his day. He was trained in a place, in a position where he could have ultimately had the highest position in the land as far as a teacher, as a sage, as far as anything that he wanted to do with respect to being a Pharisee. He was set. Plus, he had a great inheritance from his family. There's no doubt about it. He counted it all loss. He said, it's all dung. It's all meaningless. And he was so captivated by the life of Jesus Christ. He said this in verse 10. He said that I may know him. <laughs> he, his whole purpose was just to win Jesus. He just wanted to win the favor of the Lord. I want to win him. I want to be the best that he ever has raised up kind of thing, you know. <laughs> I want to be the most special. If it's possible to be special to him above all others, that's who I want to be. That's what I, that's the way I feel. Man, I want you to share with me in this. Quit living for yourself. Quit doing your own way. And you're not going to be able to do this. And you can't achieve this on your own. The, the only way you can do this and achieve this is you've got to absolutely, with total passion, trust God every step of the way. And you've got to be willing to be forgiven, maybe 490 times in a day. You've got to be willing to receive mercy over and over and again. You've got to be willing to totally lock in on total dependence upon Him with an absolute purpose to be His number one choice. Hallelujah. Come on now. Come on now. You're going to learn to love Him because of the way that He's loved you. You're going to learn how to be faithful and committed to Him because of His faithfulness and commitment to you. If you've not learned, if you've not received, a lot of people haven't been able to receive the love of God. This is where it all begins. To know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. You're going to have to start receiving it now. Come on. Come on, you're going to have to. And God the Holy Ghost has made it possible because he's come for the love of God in our heart. Come on now. You can't even really begin. You're not going to learn how to love God until you receive love from him. Huh? You're never going to be committed and faithful to God until you understand and through that interaction of that love, his commitment and his faithfulness to you. He said, and here Paul says in this whole context, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Up from the grave he arose. <laughs> Hallelujah. When we talk about his resurrection, we're talking about ours too. My body's going to go down to the ground. Hallelujah. I'm going to take care of my, I'm going to have somebody take care of my bones. Amen. In Jesus' name. Just like Abraham had somebody take care of his bones and Sarah had somebody take care of her bones and Abraham took care of them. And Jacob, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph said, you get my bones up out of here. And you take care of my bones because them bones coming up to life again. Come on now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Don't have your ashes scattered to the wind. Come on. Take care of those bones. You're, you're testifying of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that you're coming up from, coming up from the grave. Hallelujah. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. To, to not just to live the life or an existence of a resurrected human being. Not to live the life in the existence of, a, of, a, of an angel. Not to live the life in the existence of a seraphim or a cherubim. But to live the life in the existence of Jesus Christ throughout the ages to come. Come on now. Boy, is that a grand prize? Is that a big prize? Have you seen the prize? A lot of people haven't seen the prize. I want you to see the prize. Today I'm pleading with you see the prize. That I may know the power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his sufferings. That doesn't sound pleasant, does it? Does that sound pleasant? It's not pleasant. But you can rejoice in all your tribulation. You can be exceeding glad. That I may know fellowship of his suffering. Be made conformable unto his death. That if by any means I might attain. Listen to that. That if any means possible I might attain. Unto the resurrection of the dead. I mean, this is it. This is what he's talking about. This controls. I passion. This passion and purpose controls every movement of my life. I want the resurrection of the dead. I want to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, but the righteousness. Not the righteousness of the law, not my own righteousness, but the righteousness which is by the faith 
of Jesus Christ. I come against the pain and the torment and the foul spirits of ill that would constantly grab hold of your heart and hold you into a place of doubt and unbelief. I have come against every foul spirit of hell that would work against you to destroy your soul in hell. I render Satan and his work powerless right now in the name of Jesus so that you can step in to this abundant life, to this good life, that you can step in to these good things that God has for you. Oh, basipara so that you can rise and shine now. Hallelujah. So that you can rise and shine now. Hallelujah. Uh, so you don't, you don't live in pain and hurt and anguish. I know some of you have been through some stuff. I know some of you have been through some hard times. I understand that. But we just want you to turn your eyes towards Jesus. We want you to, let, we want you to trust Him. Because when you've, got a, when you've got a strong confidence and expectation, and believe me, that's what hope, everywhere you find hope in the Bible, it should be strong confidence and expectation. I'm going to read one more verse of Scripture to you. I'm pretty sure this is the last one I'm going to read. Okay? I want you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. I want you to look at this verse of Scripture. And I'm going to go ahead and start. I'm going to start in verse 22. And I'm going to try not to comment. Because 23 is the verse of Scripture that I want to hold up before you. But Paul talking about what Jesus did for him. And Paul talking about what Jesus did for us. And, and what God wants you to go around and talk to people about what Jesus did for them. Hallelujah. Jesus in his own body, the body of his flesh through death. When Jesus died in his own body, he did this for us through his death. He made it possible to present you and me right now. Holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in the sight. How valuable is that to you? That's everything to me. That's my peace. That's my peace. I'm going to say that's my, that's my joy. That's my love. That's my passion. That's why, I, that's why I'm certain that I cannot fail. Hallelujah. I'm not wondering if I carry something. I have it. I know it. I have Christ Jesus. I have the power of the Holy Ghost. I have one who's, all, who's more loyal to me, more faithful to me. Hallelujah. That I totally depend on, that I totally trust in. I need no man to teach me. The anointing himself teaches me. The Holy One has brought to me an, an anointing so that I can know everything about this. To present you and me holy and unblameable in the sight. If we, if we, if, if, get the if, if, see the if? If I see the if? See the if? Wave at me if you see the if. Here's all you got to do. Are you, so in other words, it's all you got to do. Continue in the faith. What faith? Not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness which is by Jesus Christ. Faith, the trust. Trust, faith comes from trust. That's the whole foundation of faith. The trust that we now have in Him. That He who has begun a good work. This one thing I am persuaded of. This of one thing I am confident of. Listen to me. I want you to be, listen to me. Listen to me. Satan, you quit distracting people. Just one thing. I'm confident of. That he who began a good work in me will finish it. Are you, do you have that confidence? God wants to give you that confidence today. That he who began a good work, he who began a good work in you will finish it. God wants you to have that confidence. That's the faith. If you continue in the faith, this is the faith. That he that began a good work in you will finish it. You don't need to walk around sad and sorrowful and down, unbelieving. You don't need to walk around condemned, brown beating. Miss, listen, people have strife between one another and have accusations between one another because they have strife between them and God. And they have accusations between them and God. And it just spills over into all other relationships. Whatever you have between you and God is also going over into every other relationship. Get your relationship with God right and your relationship with everybody else will be right too. Whatever's going on between you and God, understand it. It's a, that's, why Paul, that's why John said, how can you say you love God whom you've not seen when you hate your brother whom you have seen? Because he's really, once again, underscoring that the relationship that you have between people around you is revelation of the relationship that you actually have with God. Get your relationship with God right here today. Understand that you can, you can trust Him. He's trustworthy. He's faithful. You can put all your trust in Him. He will not disappoint you. This one thing you can be confident of, that He who began a good work in you shall complete it. Don't define your life based upon any ministry. Don't define your life based upon any occupation. Don't define your life based upon any other meaning to find your life in Jesus and Jesus alone. If you continue the faith grounded 
and settled. And be not moved away from this competent expectation of the gospel. See that? Get rid of hope. Throw that one out. Put competent expectation there from now on. Because that's what the word means. That's what the word means. It's over and again defined. I am, I am confident of that in the midst of peer review as well. Okay? Get rid of it. It's not just a hope. Doctor comes and says, I hope you're going to get better. You're going to feel worse. <laughs> Doc, what's wrong with me? If he comes and says, I'm, I have a confident expectation that you're going to be better. I'm confident you're going to be better. I'm expecting you to be better. I'm expecting you to be out of here tomorrow. Oh, you're fine. You're feeling good now. You've now received something that gives you an encouragement. God, the Holy Ghost, not walking around giving you hope. <laughs> okay? Because then you left wondering. He's giving you an encouragement. He's giving you a confidence. Hallelujah. He's giving you an assurance. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's what he does. He's the encourager. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you stay rooted and grounded, rooted and grounded in what? Rooted and grounded in what? Settled in what? Settled in that I'm confident of this one thing that you began a good work in me shall finish it. Confident of this one thing I'm looking to the author and finishing my faith. Confident of this one thing that the, he, he through the body of his own flesh presents me holy, uh, unblameable, unreprovable. I'm confident. I'm confident in his faithfulness. I'm confident in what he's going to do for me. I'm confident that if God spared not his own son but gave him up for us. How much shall you now more? How much shall you freely give me everything that I need to be everything He's purposed me to be by Him? Which you have heard. That underscores it. What Paul's preached, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Wherefore I, Paul, am made minister. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm just reminded that I was going to show you how that verse 14 was a state and position of being the perfect state and position before the Lord. I remember I said I was going to do that? Okay, so I'm going to do that, okay? Yes. Hallelujah. Let's go back over there, verse 15. Philippians 3.15. God loves you. When he loves you so much, you don't really need love from anywhere else. You don't. And so what, you know what happens? You liberate it now to give love. Wow. What a transition. Everybody else running around, I need love, 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 I need love. My goodness gracious. I, I can't give you what you need. It only comes from heaven. He'll give it to you and you'll be, and then your, your wife's going to be much happier. <laughs> your husband's going to be much happier. Hallelujah. True. Because when you need love, boy, are you ever critical of everybody. Huh? Because they ain't satisfying you. Ain't getting, ain't, ain't getting the job done. No, I need more. No, and I need another quality of it. No, and I need it in another way. No, 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 no. When you get love that comes down from heaven and is poured into your heart by the Holy Ghost, now you don't need any more love and you're so filled up, all you're going to do is just give it. It's going to come flowing out of you like rivers. This is what we want for you. This is what God wants for you. Don't feel bad about yourself. Right now, if that's not happening in your life. Look into the author and finisher. Cry out to God. Say, oh God, strengthen me. Holy Spirit, lead me. I thank you that you've come and teach, to come to teach me. you come to model this for me. you come to give this to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, thank Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. you know, everything that, every good and perfect gift is ours. Come down from us. Come down to us from heaven. It's come right out of heaven to us. It's a gift. And all you need to do is learn how to walk in it, live in it. Now that's only going to be possible, not because you look to yourself to make it happen, through your own strivings and your own disciplines, because you turn your heart towards heaven. Hallelujah. Verse 15, i got to say this because I turn over here. Can't turn the second time and not do it. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. And he's really talking about this one verse of scripture. Be thus minded. As many of us be perfect. Hallelujah. In other words, as many of us be exactly what Father wants us to be. Can I say it that way to you? Help you? Because otherwise, you're going to think you, you got 
your artwork is perfect. We understand that. And that the way you, huh? Well, the way you mow the lawn is perfect. Or wash the dishes. No. As many of you as, as being and doing exactly what Father wants you to do, be thus minded. Say, remind me, Pastor. I passionately pursue the purpose that controls every movement of my life. When you're running for that finish line, when you come out of those blocks, every movement, every draw of breath, every bit of energy, all your training, all your thinking, all your focus, everything that you are about is to cross that finish line first. Passionately pursue the purpose that controls every movement of my life. That moment when I crossed that line and received the crowning award of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, when Father says, Come over here, stand over here in the winter circle. I have a crown of righteousness for you. Because you endured the temptation. Hallelujah. You did not weary. You did not faint. You're going to weary and you're going to faint if you're doing it in your own strength. But when you wait upon the Lord, when He's your trust, when He's your dependency, when you say, I can do nothing without you, Lord Jesus. Is there any problem with people saying that? No, Jesus said this. He's defined in the context of abiding in Him. When he said, come and abide in me, he defined that in this context. He said, without me, you cannot do this. Without total dependence upon me, looking to me, relying upon me, you cannot do this. Being confident, having a confident expectation that this good work which I begin in you, I will complete. You cannot do this. That it's all by me and through me, just like a branch lives by the vine. You can't do this without me. Hallelujah. And you've got me. I won't forsake you. I won't let you go. You've got me. I was thinking, I was thinking this morning when I woke up, I just, I just, I'm just going to throw all the other sermons away. I'm just going to preach this sermon for the rest of my life. So, from now on, you come to church, you know what I'm going to preach. Until everybody gets it. Of course, you know, I'm not my own man, so you just have to forgive me for saying whatever I said out of my own mouth. I'm going to preach what God tells me to preach. But I'm trying to emphasize something. you got to get this. You have to get this. You can't have one without the other. Huh? you got to get You're never going to have the life of righteousness and holiness without a complete dependency upon God to train you to do it. And a mercy and a grace when you and if you fail. If you fail or when you fail. And really, from a scripture point of view, God has already made it so complete and so perfect that no one need fail. He has. He's done a complete work and a perfect work. But if you fail, there's plenty of provision. Say, there's plenty of provision for me. Say, there's plenty of provision for me. Say, there's plenty of provision for me. I want everybody to stand with me. Mama Sakuri di Kara na Tieti. Solo Mongo Bara na Batade. Sieti of Ruta Yurosushi. Oremememem Katai. Today, today, uh, the attitudes of every person in this place changes. Today, they change. You know why they change? They change because today, something has been more established in your heart and your life than ever before. Today, God, in His grace and mercy, has brought to you a provision that you can rely on with a greater dependency than ever before. And today, we pray that you will be perfectly, that you will be, have these kind, this kind of an attitude. That you will be in a position before the Lord where you're doing exactly what He wants you to do. Allowing this divine purpose to control every movement of your life. For you you're living for one moment. One moment. That crowning moment. When God crowns you. 
that moment of actually coming in the winner circle, hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant. I know, listen to me, and I want you to be able to do this too. I know without a shadow of a doubt that I will hear my father say to me, well done, my good and faithful servant, and enter into the rest which I prepared before you from the foundation of the world. From the time it was overthrown. From the overthrow. God wants you to be certain. We talk to people about their salvation. They say, well, I think I'm saved. That ain't good enough. We want you to know you're saved. We say the same thing concerning anointing. You received anointing. Well, I think I'm anointed. No, 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 that ain't good enough. Because salvation means you're anointed. God's giving you the same anointing. We want you to know. It's the same thing if we say, do you know that he's going to say to you on that day? Well done, my good and faithful servant. If you don't know it, we got a problem. We got a problem. Just as certain as we would have a problem if you say, well, I'm not sure I'm saved. Then you need to answer an altar call once and for all in a surrender and a consecration. What is a surrender and a consecration all about? It's to fully surrender to those things which God has spoken concerning you. To believe them and do them. Signs and wonders and miracles would take place through my life simply because I am persuaded, I am completely surrendered and consecrated to the fact that God put this, the truth that God put these things in my life and commanded me to go and do them. I'm consecrated. I've surrendered myself over to the Word of God to go do signs, wonders, miracles, to go preach the gospel. I've surrendered myself over to God and more importantly to live the life of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. People look at their, people, you can't just look at your failings as a testimony against you. Because there's a bigger testimony for you. The testimony that Jesus Christ has, is faithful and committed to establishing and perfecting everything that concerns you. Today, I want everybody in this place to bow your head right now before the Lord. Today, I beseech you by the mercies of the Lord Jesus Christ. I petition you in Jesus' name to be reconciled unto God. To where that everything about your life belongs to Him. If you can't say that, if you can't say that everything about my life belongs to Jesus, I want you to know we're here to pray with you and for you so that that yoke can be broken off of your life. If you want to be able to say everything about my life is defined for me and God and I live only to please Him. If that's what you want, that's what God has willed. So therefore let it be established today in your life. Let those things be established in your life. Let those things be established in your life in Jesus name. Everybody just lift your hands towards heaven. Sickness and disease. Sickness and disease. You listen to me. You go from this place and you leave the people and the property of God alone. Oh, you foul spirit of harassment and torment. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you to leave the people of God alone. Father, I ask you to strengthen everybody who stands in here to be able to war a good warfare, to stand against every lie, every device of Satan. In the name of Jesus. 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 In the name of Jesus, from this day forward, you trust Father with everything. In the name of Jesus. In the Master Karaneato. In the name of Jesus. You trust Father for everything. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. 
If you're not certain that you're saved, if you're not certain that you've been born again, born of God, that God, through Christ Jesus, by me, is calling you right now. He wants you to be certain that you've been born of the Spirit, that you belong to Him, that your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. If there's anyone, if you're not sure that your name is inscribed in the book of life, if you're, not, if you're uncertain as to whether or not you would receive from Father the statement, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come now and enter into the joy of your rest. Then we want you to be certain. We don't want you to leave this place without an assurance. And God the Holy Ghost is here to give you an assurance so you don't have to live in doubt anymore. You don't have to live between two opinions anymore. You don't have to li live wondering anymore. When you're confident and assured about your walk with God, you can hear fiery preachers preach fiery sermons and feel good the whole time. And no question, no doubt will come into your mind, one or no, no, am I right with God? But you'll be certain. If you're not certain today of your standing with the living God, if you're not certain today of who He is for you and what He's made you to be for Him, today, finalize it today. Be, be certain, don't leave this place without that certainty, without that confidence, because you can't even begin to go forward with God without that confidence. So whether you're here on the web or watching by YouTube, these, God has made this so simple. <laughs> He's made it as simple as calling upon the name of the Lord. You can be sitting right now in Afghanistan. It doesn't matter. Where are you at at this moment? All you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the power of God is present to save you. The power of God is present to heal you. The power of God is present to deliver you. The power of God is present to change you. The power of God comes upon you now in Jesus' name. And this love of God is poured into your heart. Is there anyone? here present in this building right now. You're not sure. You're not sure. You're uncertain as to what your standing is. You haven't really come to grips with the fact that you've been presented to the very death of Jesus Christ before God. Unblameable. Unreprovable. Holy in the sight. How can you continue to go on in something that you haven't even begun to have? Verse, verse 22 is awesome, but verse 23 says, If you continue, but do you continue, you're going to have it to start with. Do you know this? Do you know your sins have been washed away? Do you know you're right with God? Do you know that He's your Father, you His Son, that Christ Jesus, your Savior, your Redeemer? Do you know? Do you know your life's been changed? Do you know that you belong to God? If not, today, settle it. Get it settled so you can leave this place and rejoice for the rest of your life. Spend the rest of your days in joy and rejoicing and shouting and singing praises to the King. <laughs> Confidently depending upon Him for everything. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, I take it that everybody standing in this place is confident of their walk with God. Everybody, and that's good. That everybody in this place is confident that they will hear from Him. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That every person in this place is confident that they are been presented in the body of Jesus Christ and the holy and unreprovable and without blame before him in his sight. And you're going to continue in that. That everybody in this place knows that you are a son and daughter of the Most High God and that you live in an abiding in Christ Jesus and determine that that's the way you're going to live the rest of your life in total dependency upon him. 
Now, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you'll be happy and rejoice about it for the rest of your life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Walking around confident in God. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. We want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity always, never, never appear before the Lord empty-handed, but always come with that, that means of worship, that offering, that, that, that exemplifies your confidence and trust in Him, and then most of all, who Jesus is to you. Worship the Lord with your tithes and with your offerings, and come now and just bless the Lord, and find a bunch of people around you, hug them, tell them that you love them. Tonight we'll be back here at 6 o'clock. Tonight we're going to be back here at 6 o'clock. And uh, it's going to be a miracle service. Tonight's a miracle service. And you need to come back because you need to understand the realms of faith that Father has purposed for you to walk in. Once again, I'm still here. I'll pray with people now that you're moving. If, if Come on up. You want prayer, just come. I'll pray for you. I'll pray with you and for you. Hallelujah.